Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker for RoboLaunch series. Um, here to wrap up an amazing series of talk, uh, RoboLaunch, we have the one and only Dr. John M. Dolan. And I want to give a brief introduction before passing off the mic to him. He received his bachelor from Princeton University and his master's and doctor from Carnegie Mellon all in mechanical engineering, and he's now a senior faculty member at CMU's Robotic Institute, where he directs the Master of Science in Robotic Systems uh, Development and the RI Summer Scholar Program, which is uh, the what makes RoboLaunch possible. He has extensive experience in multi-robot systems and autonomous navigation and control, and was the behavior team lead for CMU's winning entry in the DARPA 2007 Urban Challenge Race, which led to the current revolution in autonomous driving. <laughs> He's a senior member of IEEE and co-founder of three startup companies, including Automatica, which led to the current AV company, Motional. And without further ado, I'd like to pass over the mic to you, John. Great, thanks very much, Anna. I'll just share my screen here. Welcome to everybody. Uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about socially cooperative autonomous driving. That's something that my lab does a fair amount of work in. Uh, but first I wanna start with an introduction, then just about talk about autonomous driving in general at, at CMU, and then a few research projects in my lab. And at the end, I wanna give you a few tips on applying to graduate school that have uh, stood out to me over time. So by way of introduction, this unusual looking building is our computer science building. It's called the Gates Hillman Center. And we have a computer school, we have a computer science school at Carnegie Mellon, not just a department. And you see seven departments listed within that school. And one of them is the Robotics Institute. The Robotics Institute's primary building is this one here, Newell Simon Hall, my office, window is the one that's got an oval, a red oval around it. And the Robotics Institute does a lot of research uh, in things that sometimes you might not so strongly associate with uh, robots, like nano machines is listed there, a uh, good amount of work in medical robotics. But my point is to just say that it covers a wide range of applications and not just uh, what you think about from seeing robots in the movies or in the popular press or books. And then we've got this unusual uh, organization called the National Robotics Engineering Center, which uh, is about a 15 minute drive from the main campus. You can see up here that they've got this huge area in which to do work with large robots. They've done a lot of work on robots that are out in the field uh, doing agriculture, uh, some military related applications and many different things. It's kind of like the development arm of the Robotics Institute. And uh, Anna had mentioned this in the introduction, but I direct the program that's called MR MRSD, the Master of Science in Robotic Systems Development on the left there. And then on the right, uh, Rachel and I, Rachel Burson and I together direct the Robotics Institute Summer Scholars Program, which sponsors Robo Launch, and which is an opportunity which many of you might be interested in. So autonomous driving at Carnegie Mellon. Um, first, just some motivation. And I summarize these under S's just to memorize them more easily. But really the, the, t the key one and the main reason that we don't see cars uh, widely, that is autonomous cars widely um, deployed out there right now is safety. Uh, if we had a high assurance that these cars could drive safely under all the different situations they would face, there'd be more of them out there. And that's what all these companies are facing and also in the research world, one of the main things we're trying to solve. Uh, and it turns out that more than a million people die every year in automotive accidents. So it's a very large number in the United States, it's about 40,000. Um, there are driver shortages for trucks and in some other areas. So even though sometimes you hear people complaining about robots in general taking humans jobs away, in this case, uh, we're simply facing a lot of retirements of older uh, drivers and a failure to replace them at the same rate by younger people. Another possible reason is speed ups in theory, although we, if we follow, if you've been following the news, you see that Cruise and some other 
companies have been uh, jamming up the roadways in San Francisco and other places where the vehicles are being tested. But in theory, we should be able to speed things up with autonomous cars for, ver for various reasons. And this can save uh, a lot of money if it's correctly and successfully implemented. And then savings. Um, you can have greater fuel efficiency because an autonomous car should be able to drive more smoothly than a human being. And that has to do with uh, how much gas gets consumed. And uh, finally, seniors um, or disabled individuals. One of the famous movies from Waymo was of a blind individual uh, being able to enjoy being driven around with a car without having to worry about having someone else drive him or her. So those are some of the motivations. At CMU, we've had almost 40 years now of self-driving car research, and CMU is sometimes referred to as the home of autonomous driving. And there are a number of things that have happened. You can take a glance at the timeline here. I'll just highlight one or two. One fun one was called No Hands Across America up here, where this car drove from Pittsburgh all the way out to the West Coast, uh, over 96% without any intervention. Uh, and that was using an early neural network. So one of the early successes of machine learning, which has gone on to greater glory now uh, and is really a huge part of our lives. And then also um, this race here, which gave the impetus to the current autonomous driving revolution back in 2007, even though it took a few years for things to get going. Uh, I was involved with that, as was mentioned in the introduction, and a lot of people involved with that went and started a lot of these companies. Um, so a lot of things in that timeline. Um, now this is self-driving research in my lab. I'm going to touch on a few of these, just three of them. I'll just briefly summarize them here in the upper left. One of the things that we're interested in doing is providing cheaper sensors for autonomous cars. If we can, laser sensors are very expensive. Cameras are cheap, uh, but it's hard to get range data, distance data from cameras. So what we're trying to do here is combine a, a sparser LiDAR, one that's not as dense and therefore is cheaper with a camera, uh, but then to use the combined camera laser information to uh, figure out what the distances are. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about that project in detail, but a lot of people are looking at this so-called uh, depth completion problem where you're combining camera and LiDAR. And uh, the upper right is, uh, high definition map change detection. And that's really important for autonomous cars because right now, even though we as humans don't have calibrated maps in our brains, uh, the cars do. That's what they use in order to get around. And so keeping these updated and making sure that the latest features that exist in a city or a place where you wanna drive are present is a big job. Um, at the bottom left, we've done a lot in what I, gave us the name of the talk, socially cooperative driving. And this means instances where you've got an autonomous car needing to interact with the human driven car and do the right thing. Uh, be natural seeming in its behavior to this other uh, human driver and also to uh, be safe in interacting. Uh, and there are a number of instances as are listed there where that's important. And then finally at the bottom, safe control, uh, this is an important area. The basic thing that has, uh, has been of interest in this area is on the one hand, recognizing that machine learning can be used very effectively to improve autonomous systems, but also realizing that machine learning can't is a black box and can't easily be given safety guarantees. So how do you build these systems maybe with some additional add-ons or components in the system that would guarantee that safety? So that's a high level overview. And now I just wanna talk about three individual projects very briefly. So the first one is this high definition map change detection um, task or project. And uh, Tom Boo at the bottom left there is a master student who just graduated this past May and worked on that with me along with uh, Dr. Christoph Meritz also shown there. And uh, why do we wanna do this? Well, I talked about it a little bit already, but the normal way to build high definition maps is to have a very expensive vehicle, just like the autonomous cars that you see in the news with uh, these spinning LIDAR or laser sensors, which cost, well, depending on what the size and capability is, anywhere from $4,000 to maybe sixty dollars or $70,000. Uh, 
and, and use them to collect all kinds of information in the environment. So we want to do that more cheaply uh, by having cheaper sensors. Another idea that is actually part of this is to uh, gather the information from existing vehicles that are already making trips throughout an environment. So you can imagine using taxi cabs, which are driving around the city in large numbers, or Uber vehicles, um, or buses. And that's the particular thing that we used, and I'll show that to you in a second. At the top, What's being shown is that uh, if you go from the bottom left clockwise, in April 2021, uh, there were some lane markings, and there's actually a uh, walkway here, which is a little bit different from a conventional one. It's got some sort of um, abstract art-like uh, markings to, to uh, show to people that it's to be used as a walkway. And then in May, it was removed. So. Um, that we were able to indicate or, or detect when we went through the footage that here we have a change in the walkways, because that's what we're trying to detect in this particular aspect of the project. Um, and then uh, we started to build things up or the, the public works people started to add some markings and they finally added a new walkway here, which is just a zebra stripe walkway different from this, but we recognize that now it's the same as it was before, at least in the respect of having a walkway. There are different types of walkways, but um, now we know that the walkway has been restored. And this is good for a variety of things, including the ones that are listed at the bottom. Um, the maps that I mentioned, which are used for autonomous driving, the maps can also just be used as indications of how the infrastructure of the city is developing or changing. Another thing that we've looked at in this type of project is uh, signage and how it gets damaged or maybe vandalized, things like that. Uh, and that's what's suggested by this infrastructure monitoring. Another part of this project is looking for um, potholes or cracks in the road and trying to indicate when repairs need to be done. So um, as I mentioned, we've been using public buses for this. We've got a deployment on that so that it's actually running on a regular basis now. The bottom right is shown the path that this particular bus takes. It goes from Pittsburgh down to a city called Washington, PA, two times a day. So we've got lots, lots of data and we've been analyzing those data in order to try to improve the system over time. And this shows uh, 17 different intersection locations where we were making these um, checks on a daily basis and trying to automatically detect changes. And uh, so some of the contributions, we improved the ability to use uh, computer vision. And here we're We've got a particular perspective from the car. We're trying to combine many different images from the, the bus, I should have said, not the car in this case, and then combine them into a 3D representation of the environment and project that into a bird's eye view image and then use bounding boxes to uh, identify where there have been changes or to confirm that there hasn't been a change. And this is uh, it's easy for humans if you look at the imagery, but it's not all that easy for and computers. There's a lot of complications and details that need to be worked out, and it's certainly not perfect yet, but we've made a lot of progress on it. Um, now, this project has to do in a general sort of way with driving behaviors, although it can also be applied to um, interactions between human beings and just any kind of system, including robotic systems, that's controlled automatically where you're trying to preserve safety when people or vehicles or entities interact with one another. And this is done by my PhD student, Yi Wei Lu. So what she's done is there's this thing called Voronoi cells. And um, Voronoi cells come up because there are different ways to plan in an environment. The, the classic planning problem or one classic planning problem, problem for a, a robot would be if you're in some kind of environment and there are different uh, objects in the environment, which you can regard as obstacles because you don't want to run into them. How do you get from one position to another position? If there were no obstacles, it'd be very easy. You just take a straight line motion probably. But if there are obstacles, then you need to plan. And Voronoi cells are one way to do that. And what Iwe has done is to add the notion of risk to a Voronoi cell decomposition. You see, excuse me, the traditional way maybe to break up the space for a Voronoi decomposition. And these little arrows each represent a different entity. Uh, but she's added uh, with some buffering and uh, risk, 
a, a different twist on it, which ends up allowing a greater or, or a reduction in risk in interacting entities. So I'll show you a couple of examples in terms of, uh, or in the form of uh, videos. So here you've got uh, a position swapping problem where basically people or robots uh, on different sides of the room are gonna try and switch their positions with one another. And using this uh, risk-based Voronoi cells approach, uh, you're gonna have fairly smooth interactions without any uh, bumping into one another. And again, this is something that humans do pretty naturally, but it's not, it's not trivial for robots. There are other methods that have been used called potential fields, which can get deadlocked. And uh, if you explicitly plan it, rather than giving some uh, sort of implicit reactive sort of capability as is happening here, then it can be very computationally intensive and difficult to do because there's a bunch of moving obstacles and the search space for figuring out where everybody might be in the future is quite large. So you get an idea of how that works. And then uh, this can be applied in autonomous driving. Uh, here in this case, if I run the video, the red car or orange car is trying to get in between the other two cars and at the bottom is a, a plot of the relative risk that they're feeling with respect to one another and they adjust their behavior accordingly. And then here's another position swapping one where um, at the top is a, a non-risk aware method of doing it. At the bottom is a risk aware. The difference is a little bit difficult to perceive, but, but if you look when they get into the middle at the bottom, they very efficiently just rotate a bit and then go out again. Whereas at the top, they kind of get stalled comparatively. So in this case, there's a roughly, uh, I think 5%, you know, 4.7% reduction in the amount of time necessary to do this. Um, but if they weren't spending a lot of their time out at the points of the stars, that reduction would be even larger because it's when they get close to one another that the benefit of the method comes to the fore. Um, and then, excuse me, the last thing that, uh, or the last several ones that I wanna talk about have to do with safe autonomous racing. And uh, my collaborators in that are my student, Dvij Kalaria, and then also Dr. Chin Lin, who was a postdoc in my lab and then uh, has become a faculty member at Cleveland State now. And I wanna start by mentioning that we have some exciting stuff going on at Carnegie Mellon and also many other universities in this area of racing. And uh, I think this is a great initiative because on the one hand, it's fun. Everybody likes to compete and well, most people anyway, like to compete and racing can be a lot of fun. Speed is sort of inherently fun, I think for most human beings. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is that, um, when you do this, you get a lot of the fundamental skills you need for dealing with any kind of mobile robot. And mobile robots are playing and will continue to play an increasing role in our society for many, many different applications from factory robots to uh, hospitality robots helping in uh, hotels and, and all kinds of places. So this is uh, a great thing. Uh, you can see me in the middle uh, there along with uh, uh, a couple of other colleagues who are advisors of the club. And um, this happens at different levels. So here you see a Formula One car in the front, but I'll show you in the next slide that there are a variety of other um, classes. The Formula car is there at the left. There's an Indy Autonomous Challenge. This is pretty remarkable. The, um, the vehicle's full size. It's designed for autonomy, so you can't actually put a human being in it, uh, not because it's not full size, but because there's other stuff there where the human would normally sit. And uh, the competition's gone on for several years now. I went to the uh, Las Vegas Speedway in January, and our team, which is uh, a joint team between University of Hawaii, Berkeley, the University of California, San Diego, and uh, CMU, came in third place, which is which was the best in North America. We were beaten out by two European teams, which have been at it for longer and have a lot of PhD students. And we're just having fun and trying to continue to build up our capabilities. Uh, then there's the F1 10th racing at the, uh, at the right there. And that car is one tenth the size of a normal passenger car. It's uh, originally a, a, an RC car. 
Um, but it's been retrofitted for autonomy and it's got a, a laser on top. And I'm actually teaching a course this semester, which was developed by a friend of mine at the University of Pennsylvania on F110 racing. And that's a lot of fun for students. Uh, and again, teaches you these basic skills. And then another uh, division is the learn to race there at the bottom. So uh, I'll talk about three projects that are all related to safe autonomous racing that Dvij and, and Sheen and I have been involved with together. The first one is delay compensation. Second one is this end-to-end -end vision based safe control and then tire wear adaptation. Uh, so, and I'll talk about each of them in terms of the problem, uh, the solution and the results. So in this case, a lot of people have dealt with delay, but uh, in our search of the literature, and this is something as a grad student, and maybe even now as an undergrad or whatever level you're at, you need to do in order to make sure you can situate your work properly within what's been done out there. Uh, we didn't see anything that was covering in one system all of the different pos possible sources of delay. So here we're trying to deal with computation delay, actuator command processing delay, and actuator dynamics delay. The actuator dynamics means uh, when I when I want to steer from zero to twenty degrees, that doesn't happen instantaneously. I send a command out, command out, but it needs it takes some time to get there. Uh, so that's what was done. Uh, a unified framework. We adapted what's called a Kalman filter, uh, which is a very powerful and uh, famous algorithm to do state estimation and use what's called model predictive control, MPC, which is a very popular control method for this now in order to handle some of the aspects of this. And this is just one simple example where if you don't introduce a delay over here on the right, or I should say, don't deal with the delay, then you have a race car that is trying to go around another car here to turn and it ends up going off the track. Whereas with compensation for the delay, we're able to stay uh, within the track boundaries. Uh, another problem that we were looking at was uh, related to what I talked about before, we have this basic problem of having autonomous systems with learning components in them. And uh, you can have an end-to-end vision-based learned controller, for example, where you just drive uh, through an environment for a long period of time, take all of the vision information in, apply a machine learning network of some sort to it, and then spew out the uh, what you think the resultant throttle and steering command should be. But you don't have any guarantees on that. It might seem to do well, maybe it does do well in all the things it was trained on, it may not be able to uh, be safe in some other environments. So we've tried to add to that uh, a, as is mentioned here, a, um, CBF at the bottom. So it's a control barrier function. It's a pretty popular method now for uh, allowing a system to be safe if it starts in a safe set. You write down a function, which in this case would simply be a distance function between the robot and the things it might hit, like other cars or the sides of the road. And uh, then whenever there's a problem, uh, an incipient problem or a nearing problem, with the learning-based controller, you invoke the CBF in order to keep it safe. So this shows uh, some examples of that. It's fairly long videos. So I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but the basic idea is this. You start out um, with allowing the car to crash in the simulation here, of course, in the Carla, because it's doing learning and you want it to explore as much of the space as possible. But after a certain time, you invoke the CBF, the control barrier function, in order to keep the robot from crashing and to retain safety. So uh, it goes through several iterations without the CBF in order to make its mistakes, as you see there. But let me fast forward a bit. Now, uh, we, now we've added the CBF on the right-hand side, so we're going to remain uh, safe there. It's still a little bit jittery at this particular iteration, but it's going to keep on learning. Without the safe CBF on the left-hand side, uh, it's ultimately going to crash as it just did there. And it goes on like this. And like I said, by a, a somewhat later introduction of the CBF, we retain safety while still maintaining the benefits of the early training and uh, get very effective control of the car. And then... Um, the third aspect is tire wear adaptation. And this is important 
in general, you could say, although we hope that our passenger cars are not going to have enormous tire wear, but particularly for racing, when you're going 150 to 200 miles an hour uh, and you're experiencing really high centrif centrifugal forces when you're making turns at high speed, you wear out the tires very quickly. And of course, this is the main reason for uh, pit stops that we all know from Indianapolis 500 racing or that kind of racing. You need to change the tires because they've lost the ability to hold after a certain number of laps. So um, that changes the dynamics of the car, the way that it behaves. And we'd like to be able to sense that and uh, train, train um, well, to adapt online and not simply depend on the coefficient of friction or the tire wear remaining the same. And we're doing that by the basic idea is to have a, a baseline model, which is called a kinematic bicycle model, uh, but then being able to realize that that's too simple to capture the actual dynamics and to figure out what the difference, what's called in the literature, the residual, the difference between that model is and the real way that the car is behaving and use that difference as a way to learn what the changes in the tire friction and maybe other unknown aspects of the model are. And so we're doing that here. And you can see um, what happens is that on the, in the plot there, we're, we're gonna change the, uh, we're gonna artificially change the tire friction or the coefficient of friction, the tire traction. Uh, and so at first they both do pretty well, well similarly well, because of uh, the fact that you haven't changed anything in the dynamics uh, of the tires. But now, you can see that we've started to change that friction coefficient. And uh, they look fairly similar, although the one at the bottom is performing a little bit better. Uh, but what happens ultimately is that at this, these high speeds in this winding road, the top uh, car is going to crash. It's not able to hold onto the road because it's not really accounting for this change in friction, which is decreasing, right? So it has less traction on the road. I'll just advance it a little bit. And, well, there it is. So. There it goes, bam, right? So it's done, whereas at the bottom, we're still able to adapt and continue to be successful. Uh, and this is showing from left to right without any compensation on the left uh, with partial compensation, vehicle model adaptation, but without speed adjustment in the middle. And finally, the best possible with speed adjustment where we're very closely following the, uh, the race line, it's called, which is the optimal path to follow in order to have the fastest run on the race. All right, and this is my uh, current group uh, of students, and uh, some of them have recently graduated in my lab, but uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of all the folks who helped to make me successful, because I really appreciate their work. And then this is my last slide. I just wanted to give a few tips for applying to grad school. Um, this is certainly not exhaustive, but they're the ones that quickly came to mind. I think it's great for you to get as much project and or research experience as you can, not exclusively classwork. You wanna work with mentors who can give you strong project research-based recommendations. As a longtime participant in admissions committees, I sometimes see um, only recommendations coming from classes where the basic statement is the student did well in the class. That's not really gonna be enough to push you over the top. Uh, so that's why you want this. Uh, you want to try, if you can, to turn at least one of those project research experiences into a publication that's become increasingly important for graduate school, uh, although there is a difference between the master's level and the PhD level there, so it's almost essential, I'd say, for a lot of PhD programs. It's not essential for a master's program. Uh, it's just helpful. Uh, number four there is get as broad exposure to robotics as you can, including hardware mechanisms, electronic sensors, software, and control. The reason I say that is because I want you to, um, not because I feel like you have to be a jack of all trades, but because it gives you information about what you like and what you're not as interested in. And that'll give you an advantage when you get to grad school in terms of picking what you wanna work on. Now, if you can't get that fully broad exposure, that's okay too. You can do exploration in grad school as well, but I think it's just nice to get a little bit of a head start on it uh, at, at the undergrad level if you can. And then the last thing I've got listed there is uh, you want to get a solid math foundation. And the ones that I think are most important probably in robotics are 
linear algebra, which has a lot of applications, including in computer vision, um, and not just computer vision, but also uh, things like singular value decomposition, which you'd be using in, in many different uh, aspects of robotics and other engineering uh, areas, and probability and statistics. And probability and statistics, of course, underlies machine learning and is extremely important for it. So with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have also stop the sharing. Great, uh, so we have a couple questions already lined up. Uh, the first one is, many companies are focusing on self-driving on highways because it's supposed to be easier than in crowded cities. However, it seems to me that safety is even more critical in these scenarios due to the high speeds. If you were to start a company now, would you firstly focus on getting a product working on cities or highways? Well, it's a good point. Uh, it's very dangerous on when you're going at 70, mi 70 miles an hour to have an accident or do the wrong thing or even faster. Uh, but I still would say that the best business case is for um, long range trucking. That's the one that I think makes most sense economically. I mentioned that we're experiencing a shortage of drivers and the lifeblood of our economy uh, is not exclusively, but very strongly formed by long range trucking. And it's just become more important with all of the e-commerce and uh, rapid delivery of things from one end of the country to, to another. So that's what I would do. I don't think the business case is as strong for driving in the cities now, although there is the ride hailing and, and that sort of thing, which some which has garnered some interest. Great, thanks. Uh, the next question says, do you think that the first actual self-driving car will be some kind of AGI where you input sensor data and get control commands from a single module or a system with many different components combining results from different fields such as classical control and artificial intelligence? I think it has to be the latter. Uh, I know, uh, you know I mentioned this end-to-end -end vision project that one of my students was working on and companies have tried to do that end-to-end -end approach um, notably, uh, well, NVIDIA did one example of it and, uh, and there have been some other examples, but I think, uh, for a couple of reasons, well, if we just think about, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that the way that humans drive has to be perfectly or exactly duplicated by autonomous cars, but in a way that I think is analogous to that in which as adults, when we try to learn another language, we can benefit from, uh, learning some grammar and sort of springboard off of that in order to learn the language more quickly, it only makes sense that we want to use some kind of discrete logic in order, in order to handle various traffic situations. So I don't think we can entirely get rid of um, things like, is it my turn to go at an intersection? Or, um, you know, uh, some, I, I look at a traffic sign and it helps me to understand what the rules are. So uh, there's some deliberative aspect to uh, driving and I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to downplay the importance of machine learning, but I think uh, it will form components of the system and it will need to have safety guards of the type that I was describing in my talk, which are currently not there uh, in any sort of analytically guaranteed way for uh, learning enabled systems. And we have another question uh, that says, self-driving turned out to be a problem much harder than people initially thought. How is this affecting the funding for research? Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, and I would say even before uh, the current problems that we've seen with some companies going out of business in autonomous driving, there was already the funds were mainly shifted uh, to industry starting probably around, I don't know, 2012 or so, uh, mm -hmm. 2013. Um, but I think there's still in this sort of, whatever we want to call it, remaining 5%, let's say, or, or the safety margin, margin problems that still need to be solved. I think there is a fair amount of interesting and important work going on in Academia now. How much funding there is for it is a good question. Uh, I was involved with a a well-funded DARPA project which ended earlier this year called Assured Autonomy, uh, and then there was a follow-on NSF program which is currently 
uh, being decided upon. The, the proposals were being put in earlier this year and now uh, they're being awarded, which have to do with this general problem, not just of, for autonomous driving, but this general problem of uh, learning enabled autonomous systems. How do you guarantee their safety? So even, that's, even though that's not expressly autonomous driving uh, funding, it is related to it in that it's for autonomous systems and it's for the safety aspect that I'm claiming is the most important part of the autonomous driving problem now. Thanks. Um, I have a question myself. Uh, regarding, uh, you were talking about uh, how one of the biggest challenges right now is safety. And that's why we're not seeing as much autonomous cars out there as much. Uh, so far, at least to my understanding, uh, we have been the ones determining like ethics and how we should uh, do technology so that it's safe for humans. But do you think there's gonna be a moment when the AI itself is going to be taking that decision instead of us humans inputting what would be the safest option? So let me see if I, I don't understood your question properly because there are two different ways to understand it, um, I think. One would be if you're just asking whether or not we're going to allow autonomous systems to make decisions that have ethical import. But another one would be, are we allowing, are we going to allow autonomous systems or somehow think that we've enabled them to make, to perform ethical reflection? And then make, you know, kind of come up with rules that the robots believe are ethical as opposed to what we believe as humans is ethical. So which of those is it? Is it the first one? Yeah, the first one. Okay. So because I think the second one is even a broader question. You know, it's all, it really is almost like the Turing test kind of question, like yeah. we regard humans or rather robots as humans. And that's, that goes well beyond autonomous driving and uh, is an interesting question, but maybe not what we want to deal with right now. Um, I mean, I think the it, it's going to... Okay, so I guess my first statement, which has more to do with the, way, the second way I was understanding your question, would be that my belief is that we as humans need to make the, eth the ethical, the philosophical, the theological decisions that we would then want to somehow embed in software when it comes to things like what are called the trolley problem or deciding between whether or not uh, an elderly woman versus a baby in a stroller is going to have to die in an accident where we can't avoid the death of either. Um, on the other hand, I don't think we're at the point where uh, those kinds of things arise in that simple form for autonomous cars. We're trying to make them as safe as we possibly can, but there's nothing currently in software that makes such a stark decision of preserving one life and um, and killing the other person. So uh, w will it come to that? I actually kind of doubt that we would ever have that kind of perfect knowledge from all of our sensing, et cetera, that's on the, the car for the decision to be that stark. It'd be very, It'd be almost being inconceivable for us to be faced as a human with that, because normally these things happen in such a split second sort of way that you don't really have even the time to run through all the possibilities. You just do the best thing you possibly can in the time at the time in the time you have available. And uh, my assumption, although you might be able to make a counter argument that the robot is going to have more time in the sense of being able to more quickly explore a greater range of possibilities. But I still think the fundamental situation is going to be similar to what I just described for humans. I know that was a long answer. No, uh, no, no. But... it's interesting perspective. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have also Leo who wants to ask a question. Okay. Um, so one thing that people have have focused on a lot um, in this industry is like trajectory prediction. It seems to me, I think. But um, predicting like uh, motions of humans, like pedestrian or, or cyclists, these things, seems to be such a hard problem that sometimes I feel that maybe focusing on like um, assuring safety in a more reactive manner might be like easier, an easier way. So 
I was just curious about, but but like because people have done research and trajectory prediction for a while, there's definitely value there. I was just curious about what exactly is the value because um, it seems to me that it, this is very prone, like to edge case. If you have like one percent probability that the human would turn left, you you have to make sure that you you not run over him, even though it's like one percent, right? So I was just curious about what exactly is the value in this kind of research. Why is it important? Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, I don't do much in the area of, let's say, uh, pedestrian and cyclist uh, prediction or, or dog and cat or little children uh, prediction, which is very important from a safety standpoint, particularly if you're in suburban and, and urban areas possibly too. Um, so I would say for vehicles, there's some reasonable results. Uh, you can't predict out for a really long horizon and, and expect to be accurate, but you can get a pretty good idea of uh, what the, the possibilities for, are for other, what other cars are gonna do. Um, but to directly answer your question for uh, about what the value is, if we take the example that you gave of the 1% possibility, that would not, that would not be, uh, I mean, we would not think of it in exactly that way, but if, but we would just call it in our minds as humans, a low probability. So if I think there's a low probability that someone's gonna step off the curb, then I'm likely to travel past that person at 25 miles an hour, maybe. If I think there's a high probability, then I'll probably slow down to a lower speed, maybe 15 miles an hour so that I can react more quickly. And those kind of general judgments, I think we can do now with autonomous cars. And even though it is, as you say, notoriously difficult to figure out exactly what that person is kind of moving around erratically on the curb is going to do, uh, there are some initial results, uh, which I'm not super familiar with, that are getting better anyway, let's put it that way. With machine learning techniques, there's improvement in our ability to figure out what that uh, woman with the toddler holding the toddler's hand might do in the next second or two and to apply it in the way I said, sort of qualitatively, okay? I'm gonna slow down and be cautious because this might be a problem. Uh, but thank you. Sure. I also have another question. Um, so is there any thing from autonomous driving that you can see being transferred into another area? Uh, like. What I mean is that you've talked a lot about risk assessment and detection and um, the mapping creation. And what comes to my mind is that maybe these algorithms can be transferable into um, medical treatments. Uh, have you seen something of this sort or you taking something from another field and implementing it into uh, autonomous driving? Well, I think, and this is one of the things I mentioned in the talk, uh, I do think that everything that you do in autonomous driving is, re is relevant for mobile robots uh, in general, right? Or at least okay. wheeled robots, ground robots, the mapping, the perception, um, a variety of things like that. For medical robots, uh, I mean, I could imagine, I wouldn't, I guess what I would say is that it would be sort of the other way around, or um, there would be things in perception that are being improved through, say, machine learning that are applicable both to autonomous driving and medical robotic imaging uh, and many other fields. So it's not that it's stemming from autonomous driving so much. What I think, uh, one thing that maybe doesn't directly answer your question, but is a potential aspect or potential respect in which autonomous racing could be of interest for passenger driving, passenger car uh, autonomous driving, is if you, since we're dealing with these much higher speeds and extreme dynamics, which aren't usually worried about uh, in the passenger driving case, if we can find ways of uh, dealing with those so we don't skid out and lose control of the car, we mm -hmm. could apply them in extreme cases, like when a deer suddenly comes in front of a car when you're driving along the highway, and then maybe control the car in a way similar to that in which expert 
stunt drivers or racing car drivers control a car when they're they're so-called drifting, right? They're they're in a totally different dynamic regime. The car the car's tires are skidding, but they still stay on the road and they're able to avoid this uh, object that, that could otherwise cause them harm. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Um, and also, I think taking advantage of the time and how you shared all those tips uh, for grad school, I wanted to ask you and if you could share, like, what is a valuable thing that you look in the students that come work with you? Like, uh, what would be the tips you would give someone that, to approach a professor? Yeah. Um, well, I I don't really have. Um, I mean, other than my wanting students to be diligent and do the best possible work they can, I don't really have a checklist for types of students I want to see or anything like that. I mean, I did mention the math preparation, which I think is important. Um, but if your question is how can students or what should they do to approach professors? Um, I think it's probably, I mean, one one thing that's certainly helpful is to understand a little bit about what the professor's work is and be able to ask some questions that show that it's not just a blue sky inquiry to see um, whether or not there might be some work, but rather you actually have an interest in the work or at least an understanding from the basics of it. So I think that's helpful because, well, I think for obvious reasons, but among other things, most of us want uh, students to come in with a little bit of preparation in the specific area that we're working in so that they don't take as long to stay up. Of course. <laughs> and do you have any, any tips uh, for future undergraduate uh, students that want to apply to the RISC program? Uh, I don't think anything different from what I put in the list. I think the the key ones there are getting that project and research experience um, so that they'll stand out in that respect. Um, and I know that that's more commonly available than it was when I was an undergraduate nowadays. so but but on the other hand, I recognize that um, there are also places, and this is one of our missions at risk. There are places where it's better to get that experience. So if you're coming from one of those institutions, then uh, in your statement of purpose, we just want to see a passion for gaining those experiences and benefiting from them. And I think that's that speaks to us more. So it would be more focused on the statement of purpose uh, more than experience, I guess. In, in that case where it's hard for you to get that experience, because maybe it's a small liberal arts institution that just doesn't have the research opportunities, maybe not as many project opportunities. Yeah, for sure, because uh, the Robotics Scholar Program for sure offers that experience. Right. Uh, <laughs> or at least uh, a glimpse into what research is like. Yep, exactly. Well, thank you very much for joining us in this RoboLaunch series. Uh, is there any last message that you would like to give uh, future applicants or people watching right now? Well, it was my pleasure to be able to present and field the questions. I would just encourage people who are interested in risk to uh, apply. And uh, I feel like it's a very welcoming environment and also uh, ends up being a community that uh, students who go through it end up feeling very closely tied to. So uh, it's a great program. Anna has been a participant for a couple of different years and I think has done very well and enjoyed it. Leo as well. And, uh, and many others. So um, give it a go. I can completely confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than excellent research experience, it offers great opportunities like this one um, to listen from many experts in the fields of robotics um, and a great network, not only for the professors, but the other scholars. It's just been uh, an amazing experience getting to know <laughs> everyone from such different fields uh, well <laughs> thank you for watching and i think we'll tune in into the next rebel launch series uh which will be october 15th if i'm not mistaken thank okay. you thanks very much donna thanks leo